Welcome back to the podcast with Allie and Chris. I'm Allie. I'm Chris. And today we have a very special guest, Travis. Hello. <laughs> to give you a little bit about Travis's background, he has uh, he's a veteran. He was in the Air Force and very smart guy, very kind man. He is our first client on the on the podcast and as usual, you know, I don't share any of your information. So anything that Travis shares is up to him to share and or not. <laughs> he could just sit there like this the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm to get more out of him than that. <laughs> <laughs> but once you've shared it, then we can we can talk yeah. about it and reference sure. to it and stuff like that. So awesome. It's been an interesting mm. week here at at um, Bod by Ali and <laughs> the Bod Company. So, mm -hmm. Chris, you want to give some really fast updates? Maybe Travis will be really interested in it because what's funny about this conversation right now is when you first jumped on board, Travis, and you got on the app, you found little tiny things that um, had been overlooked in different places, and I loved it. And I guess Chris was like, "Yep, Travis is is uh, pointing out all the things that need to get fixed." So I thought that was uh -huh. great. So as he says, yeah. what we're doing now, you're going to go, okay, now I know what to look for, <laughs> what to go get at. All right. Yeah. So the big things that we've been working on are getting more of the meal planning, macro tracking, trying to get that more fleshed out, trying to get that a little bit easier to use. And we've come a long way with that. It's in a really nice spot right now. Started off as oh. a spreadsheet. Started so, off as a, literally just a I? spreadsheet. That was, that was the concept. A, a, and a then, the PDF is what you got in the I, beginning. Right. And then even our second version of that was just almost a spreadsheet just in the app. Mm -hmm. It was a blocky table with all the numbers that could spit out. And all you could do is you had to go do the math yourself. Mm -hmm. It was, you had to go figure out how much protein, carbs, and fat. And surprisingly, yeah. not too many people were like jumping on that one. <laughs> they, they, they weren't just being like oh sure let me do more math this is what i need in my life right now let me pay you money so i can do math so we got to this point now where we've got all the foods so i can do math yeah. right homework that's not the kind of homework people are looking for from us no not so much no probably no. not you agree travis no no I'm uh not. so far yep i'm on board <laughs> oh he's on oh yeah well so okay. you know that's that's a big part of it right now other than that I mean, now we've got recipes and i even made you put the, some of the pictures in there this week yeah we've got pictures going in there now we'll get some some of, of those meat. yeah of the ones that we have and then yeah we'll grab some more get those all fleshed out we want to make it easier to follow too get get the directions sort of prettied up and they so step by step figure out like what's some good five, six, seven step instructions so that somebody can just flip through it fairly quickly. It would be really nice. And the biggest thing, like the big, the big help, the helpful part of the way the recipes are set up is that all the foods are recorded into it. If you follow the recipe, you don't have to log your macros. It will log them for you. That's where we're trying to get to is people don't like doing the math behind it all it's even if it's not hard math it's still just it's numbers and people don't like doing that part they don't like it's kind of I, I think it's a lot similar to stepping on the scale all the time people don't necessarily want to see the numbers and have to like manage them and all the decision fatigue of like am i getting enough protein blah 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 and where we want to take this is going to that place where it's just going to figure it out for you it's going to say, hey, you need 30 grams of protein. Well, guess what? That's this. Here, have a cup of chicken salad or have a half a box lunch yeah. or, you know, just that leftover salmon from last night. Go nibble on that. Yeah. Won't that, that kind of thing. Travis, when you just when you don't have to think for all of those little nuances yourself, like, oh, I need to get a little extra of this in. What have I got? You know, can you imagine the app just tells you what to go eat? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, to me, it takes the learning curve of the whole program and minimizes some of the more the more mundane. You can focus on on the actual action items as opposed to the thinking items. That's right. Right. Yeah. 
because our, our real goal is to help you do it's not to make you an expert at logging macros it's to get you into the habit of being aware of your food that's one one of the reasons that i think i've heard you talking to clients and you'll say don't worry about being accurate about logging every macro exactly as it should be because it's more about getting an understanding of what's in your food like some people may you know things like nuts are probably the most surprising of just how much calories are in there the fats are off the chart and people don't realize it because they're like that's only a handful of nuts it's like it's only 400 calories <laughs> right it's only half a meal that you just had in that palm you know whether what it's walnuts or whatever it's like they're all they're all like that and just getting an awareness of that is what we're really trying to get people to kind of take away from it yeah so i love when i log in and i just want to put in the fruit and veggie shake i just go to recipes add to meal i didn't drink three servings of it and then entire two you know three liter, four liters 60 no two liters 64 ounces what something like that and i just save and i'm done and then yeah, then you've logged your what is that one, like high chart there they are mm -hmm. almost done yeah, the, veggies for the day just seven right. servings in that thing yeah something have you like had that? that travis i have yep you like it do you add stevia I, to it say again do you add stevia to your shake? I did, I did not. No. Um, I, it easier. I did it right off the recipe. And the only trick with that is the volume. There's a lot. Yes. Yeah. It's from, three days worth. Not, yeah. So you go from not eating breakfast to having that. And the body's like, hey, that's different. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It fills you up. It, it fills things up. Yeah. That, that serving size that is in the recipe, that's like for one person to do like three days. Mm -hmm. So or what, like a, a, a small family, three, four people, you know, you yeah. split that up between a couple of kids and two adults, it's probably the right size. Yeah. You do one of them every day. Yeah, cool. Okay, so Travis. Yes. How did you get here? So um, Twitter, uh, social media. I don't have any other social media. That's my only, uh, my only vice, I guess, is Twitter. And I uh, tend to elect people to follow on Twitter that seem wholesome or mm -hmm. genuine and aren't abrasive. And uh, your initial strategy was just to kind of show the world as, you know, what you're up to. And uh, it came across less as like a marketing push and more like, hey, look, I'm just a human out here doing these things and look at my results. And it was a while ago. It, you know, I've been stalking for a couple of years, I think. It's been a little while. Um, and then uh, you put a post out, I think it was either in February or March, and it was really a good, uh, it was a good coaching, it, it felt like a great coaching session was just observed by all. And I, I messaged you a, a DM and said, Hey, um, I really appreciate what you just did for that person. That was really, really thoughtful. And you wrote back and you were like, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, what can I do for you? And I was like, hmm. Not right now, like, you know, someday maybe, but it really is set the, it planted the seed in my head. And I was like, you know what, actually, she's onto something good here. I like it. Aww, and then uh, I think it was maybe July that I reached out and um, I got a response back from Chris, actually. And it was like, hey, take a look at our webpage and tell us what you think. And I wasn't quite in a space to get started yet. I didn't have, uh, I wasn't motivated yet. And then when you reached out on Twitter and you said, hey, I'm looking for four individuals. And I was like, you know what, I want to be one of those four people. And uh and then it was just a no-brainer from there. So, so you just need to incubate a little bit. Need For me, yep. I don't react positively to, to active marketing. It's not my favorite. So, <laughs> yeah. There's, no. There's too much noise and everything gets lost in the noise and it's hard to compare like what's valuable and what's not when everybody's saying that they're valuable. And um, my motivating factor for you was the time you put in the time and you've shown the results and it's been, uh, it, it's kind of cool to be able to follow somebody else that's done the walk, not just the marketing and the talk, so. Well, you know, Chris did a not, little bit of that walking too, huh? You guys have a, a little, little bit of common. A little bit of walking, that, that's, <laughs> you're going with that one? Okay. yeah. <laughs> About a thousand miles of walking, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's where I started. I started out just walking three miles a day that was all I could do at 375 pounds and had been stuck in a chair for a good couple of years. And it was just three miles a day. 
three miles yeah, a day was, is a lot to start off with when oh it was hard it was an hour yeah my low, my lower back would hurt my knees would hurt my hips would hurt and i was just like i don't care <laughs> I am moving forward and I am not sitting in this chair all day. I would sit in the chair the rest of the day because everything hurts. You know, I would love to know from both of you individually, what were those tipping points? What, what was it that all of a sudden one day it became, I don't care how much it hurts, I'm gonna do this. And I, I just, today is that moment to, to move forward. And I'm, sure it's different, I'm sure it's different for both of you, but there's probably some threads of commonality in there, I would imagine. Who wants to go first? Maybe Chris, no. while you think you're out of it, unless you want to go. Mine's, mine's pretty straightforward. Uh, when I had, a, uh, I had a milestone birthday and I received a towel that said, don't panic. And it's from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I realized that there's all these funny things about that movie. You know, the answer to life is 42 and don't panic. And like, you know, and I just kind of have this awakening. I'm like, eh, I'm not, I'm not over the hill. Like I'm middle-aged and it's time to, it's time to prepare for the next phase. And mm -hmm. if I don't start now, when am I going to start? And, mm -hmm. you know, I, um, so I, I realized that, you know, you hear people say when they're 40, gosh, I ha wish I hadn't listened to loud music when I was 20. When you're 20, there's no reference. It doesn't matter to you. You're entertained by the loud music. Mm -hmm. And when I see people who are 60 and they're saying, geez, I wish I'd worked out through my twenties and thirties, that gives me that impact because now uh, it's relatable. And so I say, well, sure enough, I don't want to start when I'm 60. I want to be, I want to be dialed in when I'm 60. And so it's time to start. It's time to go. Yeah. Chris, for you, why, what, what made you go to, I don't care if my knees hurt. I'm doing this. Or, I mean, everybody kind of has that drive to want to be a parent, to want to want to have a family to some extent. I mean, sure, some people have that taken away for all kinds of various reasons, but it's, it's kind of innately there, right? It's in all of us. And there was a good portion, I would say, of my late 20s into my early 30s, where I had started to just give up on the idea. There was so much of the growing up part that I didn't get through my late teens and early 20s that it just it was kind of like I started to realize that oh this is going to be a lot to overcome and there's nobody here to really help me and show me the ropes and so I started to give up I started to give up on that whole idea of having a family of being a, a dad at any point and as much as I was giving up on it it still kind of kept chipping away every time I would see some family out playing every time I'd see them at the grocery store every time I'd go out anywhere you'd see a family with kids and it would just hit that spot in your heart that says, yeah, you still want this. You're just in denial. You're just trying to bury it. You're trying to pretend that you don't, but you really do. And it just chipped away and chipped away and chipped away. And over the summer, <clears throat> summer of 2019, it just got to a point where it was like, I can't keep burying this. And it's like it exploded out of me. It was just like, this is the end of that. You're not. I'm not, not going to sit here in denial anymore and try to pretend this because it felt like it was, you know, felt like I was dying inside every time I tried to do that. Felt like I had to try to kill a part of myself to try to push that away. And it was just like, no, no more of that. So the pain of change was less than the pain of staying the same. Yes. So you went to a lesser pain. That makes sense. It was a different pain. Yeah. But it was still it was, it, staying the same. Right. The, the pain of staying the same was, I knew that there was a bit of a timeline to it as well. Like if I, I knew it was going to take some time, it was going to take more than just a few months. It was going to take a few years. It was going to take, I mean, it's been two years, a little more than two years now. I'm in a much better position to do all of that now. But once the, like the physical pain was not something that I cared about. It was just like, that's something that I can tolerate. I can do deal with ma major amounts of physical pain. I don't care. I will trudge through lots of physical pain. Emotional pain is different. It sucks. It sucks in a way because you can't put your finger on it. So I think that's just how it was like that. That was kind of the tipping point it was just like, I couldn't deal with that kind of pain anymore because this I couldn't make go away. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, how do you numb that? Some serious drugs. And even those don't really work. Physical pain, take an ibuprofen, you're good. 
for the most part. If you really want to. And I didn't, even when I was walking and my knees hurt. I even did, didn't even take the ibuprofen. I was just like, no, I'm going to let it hurt. That so that I remember it. You, Travis? Any, anything that, uh, like a thread that might be common for you too? In any of that? Yeah. Well, there's definitely a waking up moment. Uh, you know, I think that for those of us, uh, I guess I should speak for myself, for my instance, um, physical education was just part of our school the, the when we were being raised, but it wasn't something my family was invested in. Hmm. And so role modeling came from external sources. And um, I think that my awakening moment was when I started looking up at role models and I said, wait a second, what are they doing and how are they achieving success? And I'm going to try to get involved in that. So role modeling, real big deal for me. Hmm. Um, cool. really positive role. Who would you point to as your most influential role models are they like bigger names or just people closer to you um i think that there are two one uh is on this call i think ali's a, a good role model she's put in the time um i, would I think on that. twitter ajax uh cortez right he's got uh he has a lot of valid things to say he has a lot of abrasive things to say and and that's okay. I'm, I'm okay with people having race of things to say. I don't have to necessarily love them, but uh, the proof's in the pudding as far as what I can see his results are. And I think that's respectable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of people. And I, I kind of figure some of those people do that on Twitter because it's a little more, it gets, it gets some more attention. Like you kind of have to throw a little bit into there, into there sometimes if you want to build a big audience. It's like, it's hard to just be... Yeah, it's hard to just be one way. It's like you've got to hit a lot of different groups, a lot of different angles. Yeah. So yeah, those guys get pretty yeah. good at that. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, my um, role models I can agree with. Get a waking moment. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna reference that. The waking up moment is interesting, right? Because it's, it is a moment. Is that how you felt it too, Travis? It's just like one day you're just like, there's like a, I don't know if it's just like the scales are going, 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 going. And then it's just like flip. It's like you don't really feel the scales moving, but then suddenly you realize they're going the other way. Yeah. The decision to get on board in the program was um, it, I thought it out, but I didn't know what it looked like. But it, I think Ali should agree with this. It was presented to me and I just said, yes, let's do this. I, I didn't take any time to think about it. If I had thought about it, I could have talk, talked myself out of it and you know weigh this and that whatever mm -hmm. that's you gotta act you gotta you gotta go um you know the saying is strike when the iron is hot and the iron is hot and here we are so i love that yeah you did okay. you're you're definitely an action person yeah i could like and i can relate to that too because it was like you know the the humming and hawing over whether to do it or not but once you do it's it was i remember once we started i was in both feet and just kept doubling down and doubling down and doubling down until we went from coaching to working together <laughs> to building the out together. So yeah, no, I can, I definitely relate to that. And it's what you were saying before too, how there's so many people out there trying to say that they have a lot of value. And then you're like, wait, how old are you? 26. <laughs> right. Like, how, how many, how many yeah. people out there? It's like Ali has 27 years of experience and most of these people do not have 27 years of life. And I'm just like, the math, it, it's not working for me here. <laughs> True. You guys are so cute. Um, I had a question and I was watching his finger do this and I <laughs> suddenly lost my question for you guys. <laughs> Distracting. Oh, I, I remember it was about, I was gonna ask Travis, about um because that we just had veterans day huh? and mm -hmm. how long were you in the air force for i was uh, four years active and a year and a half in the reserves that uh was converted from inactive time to active time so it's a total of five and a half years so when when veterans day comes along every year like how do you feel what anything hmm. significant anything i mean i don't i've never been in the military so i I can't speak to any of sure. that. Well, the one thing that I, I think that's important for people to realize about veterans, every veteran is completely unique. 
it's impossible to lump even two veterans together and say, oh, they had the same story. Um, veterans, uh, you know, military service members come from all walks of life, all backgrounds. They have all different filters when they're all dumped together as a team to get through a very traumatic experience called basic training, where they rip out what you think is normal in life and they reinstill in you what normal is going to be for you from now on because you signed a blank check up to and including your life to the government in exchange for what? And that what is different for everybody as well. Some people are there for college support. Some people are there for a clean break from their background. Some people are there because a judge said, this is your choice. You're either going to go to jail or you're going to go serve some time. You know, I've, I've met all kinds. Um, I am one of the very fortunate veterans that I didn't have a disability earned while I was in the service. I got out without any disability, which is different than a 0% disability. So I got out with all my fingers and toes, my hearing and sight intact. And I'm very fortunate to that. So on Veterans Day, I think to my brothers and sisters in arms who weren't as fortunate, and there were many, many, many people who go in and they sign that check up to and including their life, and the government takes a bit of that deposit away from you, mm -hmm. and you don't get that back. And so on Veterans Day, I remember uh, to be thankful for how fortunate my service was to get in, do my time, and get out. And um, the benefits afforded by being a veteran are reminded to us each year on Veterans Day because that's when all the businesses come out of the woodwork and they say, come get breakfast on us and things. And it's like, well, but I'm a veteran all year round, mm -hmm. but I'm also not necessarily looking for a handout as a veteran all year round. I feel that I've, um, you know, there are entitlements that come along with being a veteran. There's education benefits and things like that. And I've utilized a fair share of those and that's, and I've, it's helped me get to where I'm at today. So I feel like um, the contract, it, it, it is a contract, contract between me and the government was satisfied. And I, I think that I got ahead of the game. I'd agree. I, to, to have zero disability is, is amazing. Yeah, less than that. I don't even have a disability. That's the funny part. Like you can actually have a disability at 0%. And which I, I don't understand it either, right? That's okay. that's a thing. Like, <laughs> I, that's a, that, that sounds, that sounds like some paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> well, like a government that, definition to me. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so you know things like that, as I understand it, not having a disability at all. But what I understand is it kind of opens the door, like, okay, so maybe you took on some hearing damage when you're in the service. Let's see what happens in ten years as you age, and if you end up oh. having service-related injury, then that gets to be measured over that ten years or or whatnot. So you so may go from zero. A, yep. Yep. Got you. Okay. I don't that. So I, I'll, ha, I'll never have an accumulation because I've never had a claim. I, zero is more than I have, right. which is very fortunate. That is very fortunate. So uh, what, yeah. what was your job? It, well, excuse me? What was your job in the, in the Air Force? Uh, in the Air Force, I was a crew chief. So essentially a flight line mechanic. And I worked on F-16 uh, Falcon aircraft. Mm, that sounds like fun. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's military service. Uh, you know, the, yeah. the one thing that's fun about being a veteran is when you meet another veteran, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of camaraderie among veterans, but there's also a lot of uh, crap talking. You'll push each other around. And one of the things about the Air Force is it's, a lot of people consider it like, oh, it's military light, or they'll call it things like chair force, right? There's a lot of nicknames to it. Yeah. And there's lots of jokes that go along. It's a lot of fun to be on the receiving end, honestly, because I was in the Air Force. It was kind of one of the spoiled ones. Um, but then working a physical job on a flight line, being dirty and greasy, um, for some people, like I did that, it's like, okay, well, were you in Las Vegas on a blacktop, you know, or, or on concrete working around jet engines in the summertime? And they'll say, well, no, I was in Alaska freezing my butt off, you know, wearing the heaviest equipment you can to keep your fingers and toes from getting frostbitten. So drastically different service, you know, between the two, drastically different. And um, there's a lot of fun to share stories and, and to kind of compare notes and things. But you'll never, you can never, in my opinion, you can never say, oh, my service was like so-and-so service. Every single one of us, and there are many of us, had a unique experience. I bet. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm also curious how having been in the military affects your politics. 
or your okay. political views. Because that, I, I tend to hear a trend with people in the military, um, but I would not ever assume that everybody feels largely the same way. So I, I'm absolutely. really curious, what do you, how do you feel about stuff? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right. There are far left people and there are far right people that'll be serving shoulder to shoulder in the military. Absolutely. Um, it tends to me, uh, it, I, I tend to think of it kind of this way. You, you have a personality when you go into the military. The military doesn't say you're going to vote this way from now on. They don't get to drive you as a human being. And once you meet your obligation and you're a civilian, you get to have your own independent thought back. It takes a while to get independent thought back. Um, it takes a while to stop walking with your hands made as a fist. You know, like uh, when you march, right. your fingers and hands are, yep, yep. And it takes a while to relax that. It takes a while to start carrying things in your right hand again. To unprogram. Which in the military. Right. Yep. There's, there's, there's things that are taught to you. In the service, you generally don't carry anything in your right hand in case you need to salute. You mm -hmm. carry things in your left hand. So if you cross paths with somebody that needs to have a salute, you provide a salute. If you've got something in your right hand, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this programming that goes in that it takes a while to unwind. And you'll catch yourself saying, look, I was just walking in step with another civilian on the sidewalk. And for, for what? Like, it's kind of like as a child, you'll play the don't step mm -hmm. on a crack game. Yeah. But in the first right. very step, so everybody's left foot is synchronized for marching purposes. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to stop walking in step with people. <laughs> um, you just catch yourself doing it. It's, it's ingrained. Yeah. So uh, yeah. when it comes to political views, though, everybody gets to remain their own. And uh, my particular views, I'm, I'm an independent. I have uh, very moderate views. I tend to, uh, I tend to follow in my life the golden rule, treat people the way that I want them to treat me right. as best I can. There are plenty of failures on record of me not doing that, not succeeding at that. But if everybody acted that way that would be nice and so when it comes to my personal views there are things like you know should these people be able to do this in their home is it negatively affecting other people no the what's the problem right. i don't i don't understand i don't understand why and, you know but then we quickly cross over into other beliefs besides political there's religious beliefs and there's family beliefs and there's pressure from your society and all that kind of all the stratification that a sociologist would ha have a heyday with Right. Um, that stratification can be chopped up, you know, uh, many, many ways. And so uh, I think that just follow the rule of be kind to others. That's a good starting point. And then we work from there is kind of what I try to do. Yeah. And how, so what was it like being in the military with people with differing political views? Were they as outspoken about it as we're seeing people right now? on social media being so outspoken or do they just kind of keep to themselves? Um, nope, you've got all kinds. Again, everybody's got a unique, everybody's unique. So you'll have people who will be uh, very strong second amendment people and you'll have people that are not very strong second amendment people. Huh. Uh, just because you're a veteran doesn't mean you're a gun, gun toting cowboy, you know? And just because you were infantry doesn't mean that you think everybody needs to have an AR. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you've, you've put in your time as a nurse in the military and you're very, and yeah. after coming out of the service, you formed beliefs that led in a different direction than what is stereotypical. So it, it's really difficult to, um, I think the number one takeaway with veterans, it's impossible in my opinion, to put a label on a veteran. Like, what does this mean that you're a veteran? It means a lot of things. It, it, can, it can mean anything, any combination. Really, at the end of the day, it just means you served in the military. And beyond that, that's correct. It's, it's, you know, an open, it varies up pretty widely from there. And it makes a lot of sense. That's correct. Too, you're you're... Go ahead. Yep. You've completed your con with the government. Yep. Right. And some people are, some people are battle tested veterans. I'm not. I served on a flight right. line in the in final States. I never deployed out of the country. Um, I, you know, uh, people will say, oh, well, then you've got all the secrets to whatever. No, I have the secrets of the things that I was trained on and had a security clearance for. That's it. There, and, um, you know, there are people who will claim all sorts of things. They'll use their veteran status. They'll be like, oh, I've got top secret clearance and I want to be hired first because of this. Maybe there's an entitlement as a result of that. Maybe you've unlocked other doors 
in a career in a civilian career path because of that. But they don't just go handing out all of the secrets to everything military to all the you know to just because you went in. So there's um, there's so a lot you don't of know where the aliens are. Of, I mean, I can't say. <laughs> you know, I mean. Don't, don't, like, <laughs> uh, clever, so, clever. Since we're interested in bodies and fitness on this podcast in a, in a huge, in a huge way, of course, um, but it's not the only thing that we talk, like to talk about, as you know, because you've listened to us as you're doing your cardio, which I thought, I don't know how anybody listens to a podcast while they exercise. I need fast paced music keeping me going. But this is, this is two people we know of, at least, yes. that yeah. do this. It's like... Two. Two clients do that, but um, mm-hmm. what I want, what I'm curious is, so talk to me about the kind of shape that you were in before you went into boot camp, when you were in boot camp, all of that stuff. And um, hello, nope. <laughs> you're sideways now. Can you can you flip your phone at all? And you're muted. There you go. You're you're muted, Travis. There's a little button on your phone. I think he swiped over because yeah, there you go. Oh, there we go. There you go. All right. Um, so talk to me about like how your fitness has changed before you went into the boot camp, while you're in boot camp, afterward, oh. all of that. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Okay, what was so like yeah, so my personal journey, um, I was on a I was on a crusade to leave my hometown and leave a lot of things behind. So um I I signed up to join the military shortly after I turned 17 years old. However, I was between my junior and senior high school. So I wasn't eligible to go do anything until I had finished and gotten my high school diploma. So I actually, uh, 11 months before I joined and before I graduated high school, I signed up to join the Air Force. And I went through it, all the physical fitness stuff. Now I'm barely 17 years old when this happens. Um, So I just turn 17 my parents had to sign up waivers saying that they'll they'll allow that to happen because i'm a minor still um and i was kind of a wimpy kid um so my senior year of high school i was terrified that being 17 going in the military i was going to get my butt kicked i thought like there would be a lot of people wanting to push me around and, and punish me so i joined wrestling my senior year of high school uh for the first time ever in my life have i did i try wrestling and I thought if I could go out for wrestling, I can do the workouts, which I think will probably be comparable to like what the military makes me do. And I'll just get used to having my head torn off. Um, you know, like I don't have any skill. I'm clearly not going to make the varsity wrestling team, but I'm going to have to go to practice and I'm going to have to tumble and I'm going to get my butt kicked. And I did it. And it uh, sucked. It wasn't my best uh, decision looking back i i but i i'll tell you what i was fit cardiovascular and uh pretty good pretty good muscle tone and definition i weighed 174 pounds when i finished high school and went to basic training and air force basic training is not what you typically see when you think of a person going off to military training it's more mental and technical and less about physical fitness so when I arrived at Lackland Air Force Base, we were issued our, our gym equipment. And this is old. This is back in the day. This is back in 1997. Um, you were issued gray t-shirts, gray shorts, socks, and underwear, and some running shoes. Everybody had the same stuff and a reflective belt. And you would go out to a track and you'd run in circles and, and build time. And I lost physical fitness when I was there. Um, I was weaker. I, I could do less push-ups, less sit-ups, no pull-ups when I left and my running time had decreased. Um, and it turns out I was malnourished. I didn't have the nutrition to support what I, you know, mm-hmm. as a wrestler, exactly. consuming thousands of calories. Mm-hmm. And then there was a break between wrestling season being over and going into the service where I was sedate. And then I go and I hit military training and um, my metabolism was still very high and I wasn't getting the nutrition that I needed to support that. Wow. So I wasted away. Um, and I finished basic training, the pictures I have of my graduation at basic training, I look a little bit skeletal. I'm thin. Really? Not makes enough protein, not enough energy. Makes you wonder why they don't feed you better when they're pushing you that hard. You know, I got to say they try. 
uh, they do they do offer you food. They, they don't starve you at all. You get three squares a day. You get lots of calories. You get a lot of nutrient dense food. Uh, you get a very little time to eat it. And, um, you know, they, they've got uh, three glasses of non caffeinated, non carbonated, clear liquid beverage is what you'll have at every meal, which means water. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're drinking in three, three glasses of water every meal. Uh, mind you, I went to basic training on June 4th in San Antonio, Texas. So I was there for six and a half weeks as summer was really starting to cook. You can drink three glasses of water in the next hour. That's out of your body. You sweated it out already. Um, so uh, there was definitely um, some issues with hydration mm. there. But and and again, everybody's experience is different. If you're in the Navy and you go up to uh, up to the Midwest and you know you, you're at the Great Lakes, totally different experience. You could be going through that in winter time and have a way different experience than I had in Texas in the summer. That's true. And maybe you wouldn't, maybe he wouldn't have lost so much weight if it hadn't been so hot at the same time. Who knows? Yeah. And that's somebody else's experience. I, I'll never be able to compare to that. It's just a, it's a very unique thing. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what do you do now, Travis? Uh, so now I work in uh, building automation. So I, I'm an industrial control engineer and I, uh, I work from home. And I support a team of about 2,400 technicians across North America. There's 13 of us on my team. Uh, we're highly specialized. Essentially, we're field survivors. And we've seen a lot of things. And so when people in the field get stuck and they need support, they call us. And we uh, use our education, experience, literature, resources, whatever we've got to get their problem resolved so that our end customer, our, our field customer, is back in business. So tech support for the technical people. Yes, sir. Yep. I'm a person. Yeah. So all of my customers, all of my callers are internal employees to my company. Right. And I'm tech support for our, for our field technicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the one tech support job that isn't actually so bad because you're dealing with at least people who, you know, ha have some understanding of the field. They've already I, turned the computer on and off again. You mean is what you're trying yeah, to say? Yeah. They, they we do that. How to reboot the computer. We, we do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. They still have to be asked if they need to turn, if, if they've turned the computer on or off. Uh, typically, by the time they've called us, it should have already been turned off and back on. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. So you're in your car, Travis. Where are you? I am. So I am uh, four hours south of my home. I had, uh, unfortunately, a family emergency that came up yesterday. Uh, my mom got transported to the hospital, and I am her... Mm. Uh, I'm kind of the patriarch of my family. So I had to re respond to that and come down and take care of uh, paperwork. And in the time of COVID, there's zero visitation here at the hospital. So I'm sitting in the parking garage, mm. doing logistics and paperwork and phone calls. Because uh, you can't go in. I can't go in. Yeah, can't go in. Have you seen so her? So I'm just, no, no, I won't be able to until she's discharged from the hospital. You're kidding. Oh my nope, God. not at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's got to be so hard on her and it's got to be a little bit heartbreaking for you too it's it's alienating for sure i mean this is a this is a big deal uh the county i made pretty high rates for covid is what i was told at the hospital i haven't backed that up with my own independent research and nor am i interested because what source right that's one of the mm -hmm. that's one, one of my political leanings is there's so much noise that i just kind of shut down and i start i stop looking at things just like marketing me too um, Every, everything else is so much stuff presented to you. I don't know who to believe. And right. you tend to think the people with the credentials is who you should believe. But then there are people without credentials who are proving with anecdotal evidence. When I do it this way, it works too. Mm -hmm. Or you know, I have a different outcome. And, and um, I'm not smart enough to filter that. I don't know what to do with that information. So I feel like I'm out here in the middle of the mix with a lot of people in, in our country. And I'm uncertain. I don't know. And all I can do, uh, wait it out with my fingers crossed, I guess. So, yeah, I no. got to go ahead. Uh, I got to imagine that's how a lot of people feel about a lot of things right now between COVID, between politics, between yeah. like, is global warming making its comeback again. It's just like, but there's so much noise around all of it. And yeah. you, you'll hear two opinions and you're like, it's probably the worst is when you see people with credentials and they're saying things that are mutually exclusive. And, it, and then you're like, well, yeah. you both sound very certain about this. Now what? It, 
They're, you're, you're both saying right. trust the science, uh, and it's like, what you you two cannot be more disagreeing with each other. Yeah. And they're both scientists. <laughs> right. That's when it really gets a little hairy. Yeah. yeah. So you guys are both speaking to the fact to why I why I educated myself in the areas that I did, and, mm. and instead of just you know taking whatever doctor's word for it. I was like, I just want to be pre-med. I want to go get a biology degree or I want to get a psychology degree. And, you know, because relationships are very important and I wanted to work in finance because I didn't know anything about it. And I figured if I understood how to keep my body healthy, right? Through training and nutrition and all of that. And I understood how to keep my finances healthy and understood all of those different products and um, methods and investments and things like that, then I wouldn't ever have to like be holden to somebody else's opinion because I could probably sift through it a little bit better. So um, yeah, we were just talking about that the other day, right, Chris? I was like, yeah, these are the yeah. areas that I think are the most important for you to really have a fundamental knowledge in. And everything gives, else, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it gives you the ability, like those three things give you the ability to be independently happy. They give you, like, if, if you don't have an understanding of your own health, you're going to be dependent on somebody else. And that gives you, but maybe that person's really good. Maybe you'll find somebody who's really great. Maybe you'll find somebody like Ali who can, who can be trustworthy. But there's so many people out there who are not, especially when it comes to health. And even more so when it comes to wealth, because there's just there's a little more incentive to screw people over when it comes to money a little bit. So there's a lot of regulation of those, around it for that reason to help. Right. There, but, you know, there is. licensed. If you're not licensed, then you can say whatever you want. And this is you know another one of those places where social media rears its lovely little head and says, <laughs> oh, yes, trust all of us. Because we could never be trying to con you. Um, yeah. yeah. And, but, and for the record, anybody who's listening, if you're on social media, if somebody's on social media and talking about, you know, how they create wealth for their clients and blah, 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 they are probably not licensed or at least not securities licensed. They're not investment advisors. We yeah. Why is that exactly? Because FINRA and the SEC have very strict rules about advertising. Mm hmm. And so you're not allowed to be so for you if you were to go on to social media and start doing like some of these guys do and giving people advice not just in dms in private but especially in public what would happen to you i would probably be fined and barred from the industry for life and had my license take my license is taken away i bet you those were kind of hard to get well, they weren't easy. They were, they, were, they were a bit of work. So, yeah. They're smart people that couldn't pass that Series 65 to save their life. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. not, not the easiest thing in the world. No. Right. But more importantly, then you lose your business and all of the clients that you have helped are left out in the cold, too. So, you lose your credibility. Right. So, there's, there's a lot more on the line than just my licenses. Obviously, it's their livelihood, too. Not that they're going to lose their money because I lose my licenses. That's not what I'm no. implying at all. No. But they would have to go find somebody new, and they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have to do that. Why? Because I couldn't follow the rules. Well, and I, it's the, it's that kind of situation too, whether it's health or wealth, where you know somebody like you who's got all the licenses, you're dealing with a client who's got actual money to spend. Typically, they've got six figures and up. Whereas I feel like a lot of these other people who aren't licensed, they're not going for those people because those people aren't going to give you the time of day. They're looking for people who just have a little bit of money and not really much. And to tie that to health, it's like the people who really want to make a change with their health, they will go for somebody who's got, you know, the experience, who's got like you're, like you're at with over a couple of decades working at this. Whereas all these other 20 somethings and whatnot, I mean, I'm sure they mean well, but it's like, you're kind of helping people who don't need a lot of help. I, I feel like, you know what, that's a really good point. And I was going to bring this up earlier, Travis, because you don't have any disabilities or, or any of that stuff, you, as you mentioned, but I've had three conversations with three different women just this week, just since Wednesday, and they all have pretty significant medical 
stuff going yeah. on, ranging from uh, really high blood pressure to past cardiac issues, current diabetes, borderline diabetes, right? Like they, yeah. my, I was gonna, even gonna, I was thinking about tweeting this out today too. I was sitting there at my son's game and thinking, please don't wait until, until everything is starting to fall apart. fall apart. And all of these people, mind you, Travis, all of these women are between 48, 47, 48 and 54 years old. Right. Not, not elderly. Like they, that's 70. Like, can we please do this before it hurts? Can we please do it before there's like major stuff going on? I mean, I would really love for that to be the case. But I'll, I still want to fix you. But it's like, golly, I don't want you to have to go through all that to get to this awakening place that you were describing. Oftentimes, it's the pain that pushes that. And you're like, you have to be in enough pain to get off the Get off the nail. It's like the dog on the nail, right? You know that parable? The dog, that's, yeah. there's a dog sitting on a nail and it's howling because the nail hurts and it's like, well, get off the nail, but it doesn't get off the nail. It just sits there and complains. Like, it doesn't hurt enough. There's the other side of it too. Like just while you were talking about all that and I was thinking whenever somebody does have some, more, like even if they're not serious medical conditions yet, but they're just starting to, maybe it's pre-diabetes, not actual diabetes. It's like the worse something gets, the less you're going to trust somebody who has no experience. Yeah, that's kind of the point that I was getting to. It, it's just like you, it's you really want to start looking for somebody that knows what they're doing because you don't want to put your trust into somebody and have them make it worse. Oh, that, because that's that could really, that could really mess right? with your ability to reach out for help again. Right. Because then you don't trust yourself to make a good decision. on Right. Finding. In fact, Travis, you, I remember we had a conversation and you were telling me about a friend who has had a lot of swings in her fitness journey. Um, yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So yeah, she's a very good friend of mine. And I, you know, when I, when I first met her, uh, she was on a journey and her journey involved a lot of starvation. That was her technique. Um, she had a personal trainer on board and the personal trainer would chastise her and say, you need to be feeding yourself. You need to fuel your machine. Good. And she would right. go, she would get the advice and she would share that advice with me. And then she would ignore that advice because she thought maybe eating less calories would, would accelerate the results and she wouldn't have to go through the process for that long of a period of time but the process for her wasn't a life-changing habitual change it was to meet a certain goal and mm -hmm. when she met that goal then she would kind of idle back and revert back to what she for as maintenance mode and so her her uh her body would suffer um her, her body would be you know, malnourished and she would suffer along the journey to get to a goal. And when she got to that goal, she would kind of revert back to her previous practices. And then everything, of course, would bounce right back. And yeah. um, she knows that. And she has a lot of, um, you know, there's things involved with her uh, joints and things like that have, have taken a toll. And um, there's some things in her life, quality of life journeys, like life, um, once in a lifetime type journeys that she, um, has had to back out of going and doing so her quality of life the things she really wanted to be able to do she missed out on and while it's mm -hmm. not too late or i believe she could still make it and, and go do it um the mountain is even bigger now as she's gotten older and it seems even more um impossible and i think that this would be putting words in her mouth so it's not really fair for me to do i think if i were in her position my personality would approach it as if yeah, I kind of missed that boat and I'm not going to strive for that goal anymore. And I would kind of hang it up. I would just, I would just come to terms and say, yep, that's out of reach for me. Um, she may prove me entirely wrong. And of course, that's the beautiful part about being an individual. And I hope that she does. I hope that she does. And I'm sure, um, you know, I, I hope that she gets a chance to see this podcast and hopefully uh, she hears me speaking so highly. Uh, I think she can do it. I know her mind is strong. She can. Um, the difference is she asked me, what are, what is your, what's your long-term plan? Like you've got this uh, personal trainer and this uh, you're doing this online and 
Like, you know, what, what's the, what's your end all be all goal? And I said, well, there's, it's more encompassing than just learning how to do a few things. Um, there's a lot that I'm learning here that I would have it's never been presented to me before. And so my goal personally is to learn those things so that those are sustainable changes in my behavior moving forward. And then I won't see myself yo-yo and be older and in decline and then facing the hill that I think that she may be facing now. I love I that, that's line, how I put it. that line, the sustainable behavior changes. That's, that's the critical part of, you know, so much of the message that we're trying to get through to people is this isn't just a 30 day thing. It isn't just a 60 day thing. Cause those it's like, what do you do with that? It's like, you're going to be alive for the next tens of thousands of days. It's like, what are you going to do after 30 days? You've got 30,000 left or whatever it is. So what are some of the things that you're changing, Travis? Oh, I want you to finish what you were going to say first. I Well, it, you know, there's the P90X program, right? You look at the, the person on the cover of P90X and this man looks shredded and just invincible. And you're like, you could bend rebar across that human, right? It, this, this is a man of steel advertised and you go, well, I can get those results. And so you buy P90X. What I mean is I bought P90X and I load the first DVD and I, and it says, Oh, we're going to be doing yoga. And at the time I was immature and I'm like, yoga, come on. (laughs) I can't do even one fifth of the moves for one fifth of the time. I'm exhausted. I'm out of balance. I don't have like, I don't know that I'm doing it right. I was embarrassed and I shut it down. And I, and that's literally the only video I watched. And I was like, well, that was expensive and something I can't do. And I thought to myself, all right, I need baby steps. I need somebody to get me to the point where that disc is a launching point. But as I look for those fundamentals, I realize that disc isn't my style. I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, not that I can't do that. I think that I, I, I think that I can persevere. I could do that, mm-hmm. but that's a 90 day program. At the end of that program, then what started over again and right. so now it's a p 180 or a p 270x and we're just multiplying <laughs> right. this thing and it's it's a it's a high intense program well i don't know that i need that intensity forever that's right. a, a remolding of a human being and then what's the maintenance after that isn't isn't offered to you there's no light at the end of the tunnel when you sign up for a program <laughs> like that this one uh what I, what I like so far, Ali, I think you're asking me like, what changes have I made? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the changes I've made now are, um, I've accommodated for the time it takes to do the fitness. So, you know, in my life, I've recognized that while I finish work and I could go camp out in whatever I previously did with my life, what if I just carve out an hour of time instead? And I focus on me and I reinvest in me. Mm -hmm. I'm only asking Mm -hmm. for seven hours of my time and that's not that bad. That's seven hours a, a week is going to be a good investment in myself. And honestly, the workouts have gotten faster because I'm doing less of learning how the videos work. I know how to set my weights up. I have a tiny gym. I, uh, Chris, I have a gym that's probably like your basement starter gym. I've got some adjustable weights <laughs> and a bench. I've got, yep. a, I've got a, I have a support ball and that's, you, uh, I, I have a jump rope that I can't use because I'm still too uncoordinated to jump rope. Uh, and, and so, um, you get you know, faster at changing those weights too. Like once you get the spin absolutely. down on them, you get, you get the, yep. you get the spin lock off them. And it's like, I can get these swapped faster. You start to become like a NASCAR tire guy. So how fast can you change the tire? My fast, I, I can reconfigure mine in under 10 seconds. They're just little sliders that move back and forth. It's a Nordic track system oh, and they, that gotcha. different system. I don't love it, but it's fast. And if that I'm works. trying to keep heart rate up, uh, I like it yeah. for that. And I also force yeah. myself to re-rack. I mean, every movement I do, even if the same weight's back in my hand in a moment, um, I'm trying to teach myself habits for if I do end up at a gym, I'll have those habits built in. So good, good, smart. What else? So you're accommodating for the time. Uh, yep. Accommodating for the time. Um, nutrition's interesting. I, I, um, I think that the nutrition thing of it is very eye-opening for me and the way that you do macro tracking is easier than other programs that I've logged into and, and tried tracking. Um, oh, it's, wow, because I always thought I was more complicated. <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily feel like it's more complicated. And I know that as your, as your database develops, it'll be easier for me to see. But uh, you may remember right out of the gate, I was asking questions like, 
how do I categorize this food that I bought that I want to eat that's not in your cards yet? How do I know if it's an animal fat or, or not? And you were like, well, here's how we're going to look at that. I'm like, okay, cool. And like you said, maybe it's not always exactly accurate, close enough for what we're doing. Yeah. And that close enough lets my, my OCD off the hook. I don't have to be so uh, mm-hmm. meticulous about logging stuff. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've shared with Chris a couple of the, of the, the things that I discovered out of the gate. Like, um, you know, on the label, it says uh, you get this many pieces of whatever's in this thing. And that's your serving. And then when I go to add that in, I'm like, okay, so I'm doing three of that. And it comes out as nine times. Like, I'm like, wait, the math's weird. And then the numbers <laughs> do weird stuff. So Chris and I have worked there on that. There may have been bugs. <laughs> Gremlins. I, I call them that. It's, uh, this is a, po- this is your, this is your, uh, your podcast, man. <laughs> <laughs> gremlins. They're gremlins. All software has bugs at some point, right? Well, oh, yeah. and part of the curve too, though, it's not, I can't, all, I can't put it on the program. I'm a freshman at this and I have to take some, um, I have to rely on the program to be accurate enough to lead me in my way. So I don't know if it's appropriate to be challenging it or not. And so I give the mm-hmm. benefit of the doubt to you guys who are the pros to have it dialed in. And if I'm like, I don't know if this is right. I'm going to ask it as a question as opposed to saying, hey, this is busted because yeah. I don't know. It's not my technology. It's your technology. Mm-hmm. Good. Thank you. So, what <laughs> else? so the nutrition has been interesting. It's been easier than others. Yeah, the nutrition's easier to get to get on board with. Uh, carving the time out, so finding the time in a day is not difficult for me. Finding the time of day that I want to do it is. I'm at a, I'm at a point in my life getting up at four forty five in the morning is not working for me. Um, and so I'll try. I'll give a good college try on the weekend. I'm like tomorrow. I'm waking up at four forty five. I'm going to put in my hour, and I'm going to go do that thing. And then my alarm goes off. Like I reset my alarm for an hour and fifteen minutes earlier than normal a month ago I have yet to not say no and every morning I keep it on there and I wake up and I reset the alarm manually and I go back to sleep and then I go all right guess what after work today you owe yourself an hour and I kind of feel like uh the race is on like is Ali gonna text me and say dude where's your workout or am I gonna get the workout and you're like hey there you are you know (laughs) (laughs) I like that I think I've mm-hmm. only been prompted once. I think one time you were like, hey, bro, you know, you, you, you're live? And I'm like, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, working tap, tap, tap. Is this, is this thing on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's right. Feeling good. So, so uh, that's nice for me. The, the accountability is good to have. Um, I'm in your high touch program. Um, and I don't know how that compares to any other levels or tiers in your program. So um, I know we'll talk about that eventually. But right now with high touch, um, I know that at least once a day I'm going to hear from Allie and she's going to uh, either reinforce what it is that I just did or coach me on what she wants to see different. Mm -hmm. And I also know, although I'm not looking forward to it, if I haven't met my commitment, she's going to be like, Hey, um, where Where, where are you at? Where are you at? And (laughs) and, uh, I'm not necessarily looking forward to that day and that motivated to try to stay ahead of it. Good. I like that. I love that. I love what you said about giving yourself the time to take care of yourself yeah it's important it's a big thing for a lot of people it's um something that we're not usually conditioned to do we're conditioned as we grow up to do things for other people not for ourselves and especially as parents we tend to put everybody else ahead of ourselves so it it feels even harder and it feels even more selfish to do that, but Mm -hmm. it's necessary because if you don't take care of you, if you don't put the mask on your face first, you can't have, you will pass out before you can put it on anybody else, you know? And I think we forget that. Correct, yeah. Yeah, I'm really proud of you. Well, we see that over, um, you know, got the Susie Ormans in the world who will say, you're not giving out money at Christmas time until you've got all of your financial obligations met and you hear it in the air. (laughs) You hear it over and over again. You know, if you don't take care of yourself first, um, then you don't really, you're doing yourself a disservice by trying to take care of others. And yeah. it's just another echo of that in my life. It's just a different category of the same echo. It's, I love that. Well, you can't pull somebody else into the ditch if you're stuck in the ditch with them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, you know, right. well, it's impossible. And, 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 well, an analogy that I was just thinking about a little bit earlier is how much of this coaching feels a bit like you're pulling somebody out of the ditch to get them back onto the road. Because a lot of people have drifted off 
from yeah. you know a fairly stable course of life where they're taking care of them and managing things and now they've started to go into the ditch in varying degrees whether it's maybe a little bit just gone off the road and it doesn't take too much to pull them back on or some people have wrapped themselves around a tree and they've got you know diabetes and things like that and it's like okay we need the bigger truck to get this person out of here and getting people back on the road is really what we're trying to do it's like we don't want you stuck to the tow truck all the time we don't want to be constantly pulling you back out it's like we want people to get back on the road because that's where people are happy and healthy and and you're on the road you're doing all the you're doing all the great stuff yourself then you're able to help other people too yeah yeah well like in, productive it, happy society right yeah well it goes to the point you just said it's like you can't help other people if you're in debt to yourself you've got to be able to have something of you to spend otherwise you're only going further in debt like if you're already in a health debt and then you're trying to help other people well now you have, you're spending even less time on yourself and draining resources you don't have That's in a lot of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, do you have questions for Travis? Um, you guys are very similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, we covered a lot of what I was thinking about. It was just like the, the biggest part was just in that like initial journey, like what, because that's always the thing that I'm trying to like go, go back a little bit to kind of where we're at. We talked about the app and what we're building there. But one of our biggest challenges at the moment is connecting with people in, in our marketing and finding how to like get these stories. It's like, I'm going to go through this podcast again because there was some really great things that you said that wasn't just about the app as much as we appreciate those. It's also about like what connected with you what resonated is like some of that I relate to and I imagine other people will too. And that's pretty where a lot of my, that's where my head is at at the moment is there's so many people out there that we know need help hundreds of millions in this country alone, right? At least a hundred million people, if not a good couple of hundred that really need some help, help, whether it's, you know, gut health and fitness and, and all of it. Um, well, and then just... I'm gonna I'm gonna take us in a slightly different direction if that's okay. okay go right? ahead. Because I've spoken with both of you um, at obviously different times about a diff about the idea of masculinity okay. and as it relates to weight training and getting stronger and male female dynamics and I like to hear your thoughts on that specifically with weight training. No, well, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it can incorporate that. I mean, when Travis sure. and I were talking about it at one point, we were, we kind of veered off into the, into the weeds on, on that conversation about um, the ideas of alphas and betas and blah, 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 mm -hmm. and the labels that get placed on men. And it's one of the things, one of the impetuses for why a lot of men do lift weights and want to get stronger. Although I think that it's probably a negative um, type of impetus as opposed to a positive that's designed to help you really grow in, in your ability to be that masculine energy for people. Um, so I just kind of wanted to know what, how you, how you felt about that and, and did it, has it changed, you know, as you shed the weight, you guys have both made significant losses and, um, you know, I know Travis, you don't think that it's going to sustain like this, but even Chris at two something went, had like, he, I think he dropped five pounds a week for a few weeks. And yeah, just, but just uh, recently. And uh, so like, it does go in these, like you'll plateau and then it'll drop again and it'll plateau and drop again. But mm -hmm. um, has, has your sense of masculinity shifted as you've lifted weights and gotten stronger or, and shedded body fat? Talk to me. I want to hear this stuff. This is good stuff. Who wants to go first? Uh, so my, <laughs> go ahead, my, my example, so, uh, so the, uh, you know, the framework of, of my experience so far. So for the listeners, I've been in the program now for one month and that's it. And while it seems like a while, um, I definitely have some different habits now already. And I know it takes time to build habits, but I, these are sustainable actions on my part. There are things that uh, for instance, today I'm on the road, but in my road kit is my chest strap and I have my running shoes with me and I have my shorts with me. I have Please. it all here. 
And my plan was I'm bringing three days to go on a, on a go take care of family emergency. I brought my kit with me. I didn't pack up my yeah. entire, but I can at least bring my cardio and it's here. Cool. And, and uh, so I, you know, I'm staring at the light and I'm thinking, where am I going to go get this done today? Uh, and I'll get it done because I, I, this is what I'm doing. I've made up my mind and this is what I'm into. Um, as far as uh, masculinity and physique and things like that, um, I'm doing this program for me and I'm doing it. I'm not, not trying to change my status or what people think of me. This is for me. Um, I'm re I'm reinvesting in myself. And I think that um, everything that I've paid for in life that invested in myself has paid dividends in doing so. Mm. Um, you get what you pay for. If you put in the time, you're going to get um, you're going to get positive results out of that. And one of my, uh, one of the things that I look back on as a learning moment, I'm not going to say it's a regret because I, I, who I am today is a filter based on who I've been, who I was in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a horrible student in high school. I didn't apply myself. I was smart, but I didn't apply myself at all. I had people who flat out told me you're not going to be successful period. And these were people who were guiding my, my career path and, and, and whatnot. Um, I had to prove it to myself later on that you can, you can do this. You just have to make it a priority and invest in yourself. When you invest in yourself, it, it means more than anybody else. You have a dog in the fight, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when it comes to masculinity and um, you know, the alpha beta um, dynamic and whatnot, what I'm, what I'm prepared to take on my shoulders are alphas who come at me and say things like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, or you're not, you're not lifting for gains and you don't, you know, your, your muscles aren't as defined as mine and whatnot, or you're just an old guy doing this, whatever. I don't care. I don't care. I'm not doing it for you. I'm really not doing it for you. This is for me. And my success may look different than theirs. And here's the fun part. I respect their opinion. Like I'm not, saying they're wrong i'm not mad at them for having that opinion that's their opinion and they get to have it and let them have it see i love that emotional stability and i think that's what to me that's what i hear people talking about when it comes to being you know that masculine presence being an alpha it's having that emotional stability where you can take on that information and it doesn't affect you and as women we don't tend to naturally lean that way. We hear things and we have emotional, you know, reactions to them and we wouldn't necessarily respect that opinion <laughs> if we didn't like it, you know what I mean? We would try, it's, I, think, I think it's something that we have to learn, but I, I think that's a beautiful demonstration of masculinity. Yeah, I think I can resonate a lot with that too, noticing a lot of transforming over the last couple of years where before I might have looked at a lot of that and coming from like a very insecure mindset a couple of years ago and thought you know are they right maybe I am not that good maybe I do need to be more like them and kind of felt pulled or pushed in that direction of it, it's kind of got that gaslighting effect to it where if you're a bit insecure of your own then what they're saying can really have an influence and that's why they do it right I mean you look at looking at it from the place I'm at now, I actually kind of feel sorry for most of them because they seem like they're the ones that are lost. They, they seem like, I'll look at so many of them and think, you really don't have a clue how any of this works. You've kind of sort of taken a little bit of the basics of truth and then found a way to almost like market your version of it to a bunch of people who don't know any better. You look at that whole rational male group of people, it's like, there's a little bit of sprinkle of truth, right? They'll start with some baseline of truth. They'll start with a one true statement. That's just like something that mostly everybody knows if you had any kind of proper, you know, if your parents were together and they didn't kill, try to kill each other, right? It's just like, you've seen how a healthy relationship sort of looked, or even if there was just one in your family somewhere and you had some concept of that, you're like, okay, this sounds kind of true. And then they go off in these weird directions that anyone who has a real sense of what is a good, healthy relationship looks at and says, that's bullshit. That's, that's not how any of this works. Women don't just hypergamy their way through life and monkey branch from person to person and 
men don't just spin plates or whatever the hell they come up with for all of this stuff. It's like, nobody really does that. That That's a very small group of people. And well, it very is insecure people that very insecure people. Things. And, and I think the more I've started to realize that the more I look at that and say, no, these are kind of sad people. Yeah. That they, they don't see the bubble that they're stuck in. And it, it's not, it doesn't have that pull anymore. It doesn't have this manipulation that it might have used to. And it, from just my own perspective of kind of feeling more masculine in that sense, it's like, I think what, what um, Travis was saying of like, you don't do it for them because why would you? It's like, you, you're kind of, it's not about looking down on them. I don't look down on them either. I just look at them and say, okay, you, you, that's your life. You get to make your choices. I get to make mine and I ain't going your way because <laughs> that does not look healthy to me. That looks like all kinds of attachment problems, all kinds of, you know, insecure relationships where it's just like you want some, you, you just want a woman who does what she's told all the time. Like, what is that? That's not a human being anymore in my mind. That's just what a slave almost. It's like something gets very, very weird, very fast. You were going to say something, Travis? I, I just think, um, yeah, I've got a real personal connection to that exact, uh, the, the Red Book. Um, it was years ago. I, I, I want to touch on this just quickly, and then I don't need to dwell on it. But it was years ago. I was listening to a podcast driving across the state. And um, in the podcast, there was a list of 10 books that every man should be reading to get on. You know, it's the, it's the power list. The, every man needs to read these 10 books, you know, before they head off in the world or whatever. And and Rational Mail is one of those. And I remember getting it. And um, to be honest, it was the reason why that and another book ended up on my list is they were the two least expensive books on the list. And I was like, I'm going to start with those. Now, I'm not much of a reader. So I'll grab a book and I'll, I'll pick it up. And if it's captivating or whatnot, I'll be like, hey, I'm going to read into this a little bit. And that one uh, was interesting to me because I picked it up and I read kind of the foreword of it. And I was like, nah, I don't think that's for me. And set it down. Uh, it, it got me in trouble. I'm not going to lie. It got me into trouble. Um, I lost a very, uh, very powerful relationship, a very strong relationship of mine over that book. Um, wow. Just having it, I was guilty by association. And um, the person mm -hmm. who I got with just assumed, hey, this is on your nightstand. Do you believe in this stuff? And I was like, no, I don't. I don't even know what that stuff is. I haven't read the book. Um, I read the foreword and I put it down. It wasn't resounding with me. It wasn't, doesn't seem like it was for me. And, um, and it cost me big, it cost me big. And uh, oh, it, it, it is what it is, you know, and life, life goes on, but um, still working on that one. But one of the things, one of the positive things I was going to say, uh, Chris, you were talking just because I'm unaffiliated, unaffiliated with somebody else's cause doesn't make their cause wrong. And just because right. somebody's affiliated with my cause doesn't make my cause wrong. And, and so, as you were saying, like, you know, people are going to judge us based on our paths. They're less affiliated with what is going on in our world and where we came from than what we are. <laughs> we're the only ones that know our background and how we got here. And we're the only ones yeah. at the end accountable for making decisions to make healthy choices moving forward. We're the only ones <laughs> we, we therapists, we can go, do whatever we want to do and all that you know we're the only you and i ali yourself we're the only ones that know all of the filters that built you to, into who you are yeah and that point you made about like those people who are going to look at what you're doing and judge you if you like if you you know the way i look at those people today it's just okay go ahead judge away you're wasting your time because this is you're just spending your time worrying about me while well, I'm not worrying about you. I'm not judging you because I don't care about you. <laughs> it's just like, I'm not spending two seconds. It's like with any of those guys, whether it's these rich Coopers, Rollo Tomas, I don't care. Go do whatever the hell it is you're going to do. I'm not even judging them because I have nothing to do with them. I've moved, long moved on. And I mean, they come up because people bring them up and it's just like, they're kind of the names in that space. But like, you know, when we were talking to role models and stuff like that before and diving into this whole realm of masculinity, the people that I look to for this kind of things are going to be like David Goggins, Jocko Willink, right? <laughs> like there's, there's some authors who 
like what what is this Rolo or whoever you know pick any of a dozen names that are kind of writing books on the same lines it's like what else have they done other than write a book anything significant uh, you, nobody pretty much anybody listening to this probably knows who Jocko Willink is he's a pretty big name at this point dude's a couple of decades Navy SEAL commander it's just like I think the guy knows a thing or two about masculinity I think he's got something to say about it and he's usually pretty damn bright. And what I love about a lot of his message is how it's not just about being some brute. It's not just about, it's like, like he will preach how much he would rather, he would run away from a fight rather than engage with somebody. He's like, I'll turn my back on a fight. You can throw punches at me. I will just walk away. I'm not going to fight you. Why would I do that? That's a, that's a dummy move. Mm, I love that. Right. And that's, that's, that's a, that, right, that's real strength, real strength to not engage with somebody who's trying to pull you down. Mm. To say, no, I'm not going into that ditch with you. Yeah. Right. I, I avoided the ditch, right. I, or I got out of the ditch. I'm not going back in just because you want to sit there in the sidelines saying I'm in the wrong for being on the road and that I should go off into the woods with you. No, 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 this is not how that works right it's just like yes. once you can see once you have that perspective i think is what you get to eventually is once you have the perspective of what a good path through life starts to look like you look at a lot of those people and be like no you're that's kind of sad that you're stuck there you're stuck in this place that you can't see your way out of it and you don't think that you need to ask for help you think you're the leader i think they're chasing happiness from external sources instead of yes. their, instead of their own internal sources you know, that's a really good way to put it. So they're constantly seeking validation or, you know, something that's going to make them happy. The right woman will make me happy or, you know, all or the of right group of guys, right? right have, have guys, all these... or the right physique or the right whatever. And because yeah. that will have, that will give me the prestige and that will give me the accolades and that will give me all the validation that I need, but it won't fill up the hole that they feel about themselves yeah that obviously you two don't have which i think is magnificent and so, yeah. head before though and it, it's that's the the interesting perspective that i have now is having had that void and having felt that pull because like i can remember two years ago was probably when i first found out he, with rollo was one of the first people i found out about on twitter it was one of the very first accounts, probably inside of the first 10 accounts I found. Somehow, I don't really know why. I think I was looking for like dating relationship type stuff on there or had found it in some roundabout way. And so that had come up. But even then, it was like I, I could feel like, oh, is this what I'm supposed to do? Is this who I'm supposed to follow? Is this like I was just reading the tweets. I didn't read the book. I think it was something called Rolo Quotes. It was another account. And it was just like, is this really what I'm supposed to be learning? Is this really what I'm supposed to be following? Because it didn't sound right. It didn't sound right at all. It was just like, but I didn't know a whole lot. I didn't know much better. And I thought, this something's not adding up, but it just, you know, at that time you could feel that pull. I think that it that it's the the question mark there for you was was okay. I don't have enough experience and clearly I don't, I haven't gotten anywhere doing what I've been doing. So maybe this is the piece that I've been missing. So maybe I'll listen to them. And I think that's right. where, you know, people start to fall down that rabbit hole. I mean, the manosphere kicked me in the face pretty hard when I first got on Twitter too. And I went, what just happened? <laughs> Who are these crazy. people? Well, and you've got so, so much like of a different... this? Oh my God. Right. Like, for maybe those who don't know my background, I don't, I've never been in a romantic relationship before. I've never had a girlfriend. So I've never been in that context. And, you know, for someone like you to have come into Twitter, Allie, you've had relationships since you were in high school. So like you've had lots of relationships, a marriage, all of that. So yeah, you probably seen all this and we're like, the fuck? What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> In a big way, I went, oh, but then I started to realize, well, if this is some of the stuff that my, uh, my ex was, was being exposed to, then I could see why he ended up being such an 
such a very special individual. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm not referring to my ex-husband. I'm referring to yes, the more recent ex. Yes, the more recent ex with the now criminal background from mm -hmm. his dealings with me. Anyway, yes. that ge that gentleman. <laughs> yes. Um, no, and I think that's the biggest. You know, the biggest takeaway of masculinity is realizing that it's not about what you can convince other people of it is that do you have this inner strength to just stand on your own two feet and be yourself because I think a lot a lot like the military how you were saying there is no you know bucket that you can put all veterans into yeah so they're not all the same you can't right I don't think there's really this is maybe this has been my biggest problem with the whole definition of masculinity is trying to make it oh this is what it looks like oh if you don't look like the rock or if you don't look like Jocko or if you don't look like Joe Rogan or something like that then you're not masculine but then you look at somebody like well Jordan Peterson dude doesn't look like the rock he's not jacked right he's not six foot three Samoan that can throw people over ropes he's a professor would you say he's not masculine I'm you know as, as, as like for an open question for people to think about it's like I think some people would. I would. And I would say the reason why I would say he is masculine is because he does not bow to other people's nonsense. He does not look for external validation. He's got everything he needs in himself to have that conviction to stand behind his beliefs, to stand up for what is what he's saying. And that matters more than what you look like. A whole lot more than what you look like because you know you, you can project that to so many more people people yes i think there's a certain aesthetics and vanity and and stuff like that it doesn't it's not irrelevant but at the end of the day if you can't stand for what you believe in does it really matter what you look like right you can you can be six foot two 220 and shredded and if i can just make fun of you and you start crying are you really is that masculine i don't i don't think that's how that works right you, you, have you two noticed your mental strength, your, me your mental toughness increasing as you've been lifting and working out? Mm -hmm. Do you notice your, your mental fortitude shifting at all? For, for mine, again, with just such a short time under my belt so far, I have, uh, I know that if I'm doing a plank and if I'm, I'll set my, you know, initially when I was doing my workouts, I would set a timer that was set at 42 seconds and I would start the timer and I would the position and I would just close my eyes or look to the left away from my clock and wait for that timer to go off. And now I'm using a counter. So instead of setting it to 42 seconds, I turn it on and I look away and I go until I'm about to just drop out and I'll look down and see I'm at 53 seconds. Then I go, you know what, man, you're only nine seconds away from getting to a minute mark. Hang in there. And that mental ability to do that is stronger now than it was a month ago. Um, when I am feeling the, the a burn, you know, I'm, in, I'm at rep 10 and I'm like, this is probably heavier than I probably should have picked up this time. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You're at set three, rep 10. I've only got two more to go. And Chris, I channel your voice. And Ali, I channel your voice from the podcast. And I just hear you go, those reps matter. And then I go, yes. okay, then here comes 11. Because this is the one that matters. And yeah. then when that yeah. one's done, I just take a deep breath and I, and I go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to prep for rep 12 and I'll breathe out and I'll take a breath. And I'm like, this is number 12 and it's easier than 11 was um, mm. because I made up my mind. This is going to happen. We're not stopping here. We're going to do this. And um, for life. I, I, I hope so. Yes. I, I can't. Uh, I think this oh, is a great. Oh, that is. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. So, um, you know, like, like you said, um, you know, when I'm doing my cardio, when I get to that 19 minute mark, I'm like, Ugh, uh, this is today's not a good session. But at least you're about to get your 30 minutes and you're only 11 minutes away. And right around the 27 minute mark, I'm like, look, look you're only four minutes from the requirement, uh, you know, the, the, the target. But it's that extra 20 minutes after you've gotten to the 20 minute mark that makes a difference. I'm like, so what's the difference between 30 and 45? And my brain starts doing this stupid thing. And I challenge myself and I go, you're going to go to 45 minutes today and I'll push myself to 45 minutes. And then 
I look at my watch and it says I'm at 6,200 steps. And I'm like, okay, now you're going to go to 7,000 steps. Like, and so there's these little mini milestones that I'm doing. And so I'm looking for those now. And that motivates me to complete at the level I'm at. Beautiful. And I expect that'll probably change again. Mm -hmm. It will. It will. I'm very proud of you. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I love that it went from, I just need to endure it to get to this, to get to what, what, what she told me to do to now let's start running up the score. Right. That's mm -hmm. how you know that your yeah. internal motivation is shifting from, I want to avoid the pain to turning. And I want to embrace the pleasure that I get from that. Like that's how you know that that elite fitness is just a matter of of time because that mentality is what needs to happen. That's the switch from I have to do it to I get to do it. Yeah. Right. When you when you when you can right. get to that point, and a lot of people they're not at that point. They're in this. Oh, I have to do this. I have to do this. And so, like, I go to the gym, and I'm like, I get to go to the gym. I get to go to the gym again. Right. And to like what what you were saying about how you know you'll get to that last rep on that last set and be like but i got more in me right i was doing back on friday and one of my i had already done i'd done my three sets of seated rows i'd done my three sets of one arm rows my back was getting pretty fatigued it was it was getting in pretty good shape i knew i had one more big exercise left so i wasn't blowing myself out too much on those i put i pulled pretty hard and fatigued out pretty good then i had t-bar rows left See, my rows are pretty tough. And I just went and said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish off on this. And I got through my first three sets, lifted pretty much as heavy as I normally would, if not a little heavier. And then I added in five more sets. And what I did was I just walked it down. I went from three plates on the T-bar row to two and a half, to two, to one and a half, to one, to a half plate, to a 25 pound. And no, no rest in between. Just the time to get off, take the plates off, and it's called drop sets, strip sets, some people call them, and just kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going. And it was like, I was doing 25 pound T-bar rows down from 135 to 25, doing like, you know, I got nine reps because I was pulling that thing back and I'm like, I cannot do this 25 pound plate anymore. That's how fatigued things were. And I got, I let that thing down and I had the biggest smile on my face. Like, yeah, that just happened again. <laughs> so I mean and that's where my mind that's the mental that's the shift it's like I don't look at it as I need to endure this it's like no I get to do this I get to push myself to this point where I'm going to enjoy going and resting I'm going to feel good about it I'm going to go you know have a nap or sit out in the sun or just go do some work sit on the couch and, and relax a little bit and have a smile on my face to say yeah, I got shit done today. Um, and that, that's kind of where it's shifted for me, too. And it, it's that whole shift of not, I have to do this. Like, we're going to go to the gym on Monday. And I'm like, I can't wait. We didn't go to the gym today. I mean, it, it's one of the things to do. But it's just, you know, looking forward to it. It's like, yeah, leg day, Monday. Mm, can't wait. It is leg day. It is. <laughs> There's that smile. See, this is the masochism, the masochism in both of us. It's just like, it's leg day. <laughs> the little kid comes out. Mm, yeah, I won't be walking on Tuesday. Just kidding. It's why anyway. Tuesday's chest day. That's how I do it. I go from legs to chest. It's like, it's the only thing I can really move at that point. <laughs> Anyway, um, I think that's a really good place to, to stop unless you have anything else you want to add, Travis, or ask or anything like that. It doesn't have to be like a one-way thing where we're the ones asking all the questions. <laughs> you can oh, ask yeah. questions back. No, it's great. Um, well, you know, being uh, only a month into the program, uh, one of the changes that I'm seeing that you're, you're working with me now is more on the psychological aspect of things. And um, I, I did a pretty thorough dump of some childhood trauma a couple nights ago, and um, that's not something that I find easy to do. And so um, as part of this program, I, I think that maybe when people are looking at what you're offering, I'm not sure that, it, that, that I knew that that was going to be part of this. I, I think that that was a welcome uh, benefit to what's going on here. And, and you've also been coaching me in the sense 
uh, you know, I'll, I'll say things like, Hey coach, you know, like I'm, I'm dripping on the floor right now and I'm sending you my result of this thing because I'm about to go get away from technology. Now I've worked it and I've used it and I'm done with technology today and I'll send it and you'll be like, Hey, good job. And I'm like, okay, cool. And then, you know, part of your, your coaching would be like, well, how did you, you know, what's your reaction to that? What's your feel? But now it's shifted into now that I'm going into month two, I'm seeing you say things like, all right, now we're going to start working on your desire to be doing this. And we're going to be recognizing the wins and we're going to start looking less and less or for shorter duration at the things that you felt were possibly negative. So we're going to turn that light and that's the next habit that I see coming down the pipe. And that's exciting. Um, uh, so for, for those people who aren't aware, uh, if that's not a part of your standard program, uh, cool. Thank you. If it is, get that out there somehow. Find a way to share that um, so that people can expect that as well. And I think that will hit, um, not that I'm a marketing strategist or anything, but that's a really cool thing that I don't even know how to put into words. Um, but it's pretty cool. I like it. And thank you for providing I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because that's something that we've talked about, about how much should we put that part of it out there? Like, is the fact that you know, she has a master's degree in psychology and counseling psychology. It's something that she did for a while and she's good at it. I know this firsthand. We did it for damn near the whole, almost all of 2020 and into the beginning of this year. Um, and it was one of the biggest things that helped me too because it's so much of its mindset you're trying to change your mindset it's not just about changing your body that's i think to hit those like 30 to 90 day programs your p90x or whatever it's like sure they will change your body a little bit if you follow them they definitely will because they're going to get you burning lots of calories they're going to make you burn more than you consume um and you're going to feel better right you're going to have psychological benefits to it but if you haven't made that identity shift if you haven't changed from, oh, I'm, you know, this is who I used to be. Like I, I used, you know, over a decade ago, I used to be a smoker. And I remember that identity. If you called yourself, I am a smoker. It wasn't, I'm someone who smoked cigarettes. It was, I am a smoker. It was an identity. And you couldn't imagine yourself being not a smoker because it was part of who you are at that point. And the same thing goes with a lot of unhealthy eating habits and or any of your habits. It's like, whatever it is you're doing, you could be a gambler, you could be, um, you know, into too much junk food or, you know, binge watching movies all the time, whatever it is, you make that part of your identity. I'm the one that's watched 7,000 movies. It's like, okay, right. There, there might be a problem if you watch that many movies. It's like all of those things. Um, but yeah, we've talked about how much we should or how we should go about communicating that to people. Yeah. Because I mean, it's, yeah. it is unique that you're not going to get inside of personal trainers. Right. On their own. Right. You know, it's, um, it's interesting that we're talking about identity because it is, it is part of that, like, you know, process that I have. And um, I was, I started telling my kids years ago that whatever words follow the words I am shapes your behavior, shapes oh, yeah. who you are, whoever you think yourself to be. So as my daughter started competitive sports in high school, and she's, you know, in her first year of high school, I started talking about like, okay, so now that you're doing that, you have to, you're training as an athlete, you have to fuel your body as an athlete. So I keep, you know, putting that word in her head so that she starts identifying, I am an athlete. So then she, what comes out of her mouth is, I'm an athlete, I can't eat like that. I'm an athlete, I can't do that. I'm an athlete. And then she's gonna treat <laughs> her body that way. And that will be her, that that's one of her little edges that she gets to you know she gets to wear it's her badge and she's it's like part of like that edge that she has that makes her that is that foundation of greatness for her and um it's very intentional <laughs> it's, it's well the, the thing that i've learned the most about identity is number one it is the most important thing that you set for yourself and while it's not set in stone it's not easy to change. Changing an identity, and the longer an identity has been sort of rolling around in your head, the harder it is to make that change. That's why people, you, you see these, oh, people who are obese have a 90 some odd percent failure rate. It's like, yeah, because you can't treat that with just 
the obesity you cannot treat with just a diet plan and an exercise plan. I will guarantee you that will fail every time. You have to change identity. Like there was so much identity I had to change. I associated myself with, I'm a lazy person, right? That, that's how I saw myself. It was just like, well, I don't do these exercise things. And if I did them, I felt embarrassed about doing them because it was so much against, like I felt like I was lying or being like not truthful with people. It's like, that, that was being deceptive by going for a walk almost, right? And not, not quite exactly that, but it was like along those lines and it just felt, it felt weird to do it, felt ashamed of it. And so then I wouldn't. Hmm. And that was the identity shift to whereas now it's like, you know, I don't walk around the gym. Some people say like, walk around the gym like you own the place. And it's like, I get this, I get the sentiment, right? It's like you, that you belong there is how I would probably be more put it. But it is about not thinking that you don't belong there and, and kind of getting rid of that. It's like you belong there just as much as everybody else does. You paid your membership, right? Okay, you belong there, mm -hmm. right? That, that's all this only requirement that's there. You, you don't have to throw around 80 pound dumbbells, right? Just do, do you, mm -hmm. but you belong there as long as you pay your membership. That's it. That's really the only thing that's a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that identity shift is the most important part and it's the one that if you you want maybe this is where the trust comes in the most is when you do need to make an identity change you don't want to put that into the hands of somebody who's going to shape a bad identity and i think like this maybe double tables a little bit back into kind of like those manosphere kind of red pillage type people and not just them i mean there's a dime a dozen types of people like them that are looking to shape a negative identity into you they're almost building insecurity in whereas you know working with ali has all been about shaping security in yourself that, that's how i've always felt i've always felt like i became more independent the more we worked on stuff together is that how you say about the same travis yeah I, I a lot of what you're saying is just echoing like um I wouldn't say that I'm prepared to finish your sentences, but as you're, as you're finishing your sentence, like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. So yeah, I like it. Well, I, I, I love that you said what you said about the, about the whole psychological part being coming up now and, and doing some of that work that means a lot to me. So I'm really glad that's good. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a great note to finish on unless anybody has anything else they want to add. I am good. No, this is great. Thanks for being your guest. That's awesome. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for being on. We really appreciate yeah. it, especially with everything you have going on today. <laughs> yeah, definitely appreciate it. So we'll let you go so you can get that cardio in. Yep. That, that's, I'm going <laughs> to do my best. I really am going to do my best. I know you are. Yeah. You are. Awesome. You've been doing great. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for being here. All right. Bye. <laughs> Take care.